Mama Comes Home by Rosa Morrell, grade six. Act one, scene one. A musty, worn out shack just outside of Brooklyn, New York during the Great Depression. Mouse sits barefoot center stage, sprawled on the dusty floor, dressed in a ripped, faded dress. She drags her fingers through the dirt as though drawing a picture on the ground. Her hair is a rat's nest, pulled up messily with a bright blue satin ribbon the only splash of color amidst the dull scenery. Beside her sits a rag doll that appears to have been handmade. The backdrop is as colorless as her outfit, a mashup of wooden planks and sheet metal and a lopsided wooden door at the rear of the stage and a crooked bed at one corner. Mouse, mouse, that rascal, mouse. Ruby enters. She wears a red bandana across her forehead, gloves with holes in them, and a white stained apron atop a brown and white polka dot dress. In her arms, she carries Junebug, whose clothes are as drab as the others, except for a green knit hat with a smiling bug ironed onto it. Today, Ruby seems more distracted than usual. Ah, oh, there you are. When you didn't answer, I thought perhaps you had gone off somewhere. Gave me a fright. Had to go fetch Junebug. She ran off again. Funny, isn't it? She only just learned to run, and I'm already losing track of her. It's freezing out there. I went out to the pond, and it's just about frozen. Snow's piling up quite fast. We just can't seem to catch a break, can we? Speaking of which, golly, would you look at the time? I've got a shift at the diner at noon. Mrs. Herkshire will be here in about 30 minutes. Think you can manage Junebug till then? Thanks so much, sweetie. Well, enough about me. What's up with you? <laughs> <laughs> I found something shiny in the, between the wooden boards. It looks like a diamond. Did you? May I see? That's just lovely. Why don't you keep that safe for me and we'll show Mrs. Herkshire when she gets here. Thank you, Mouse. The children's mother has been away job hunting for two years, leaving only a few months after Junebug was born. Well, I'd better be off. I wouldn't want to be late to work on a Monday. Love you, Bug. Love you, Mouse. Bye, Ruby. I love you. Bye, Ruby. I love you. <laughs> Ruby pulls on a jacket much too thin for the weather, opens the door, and a gust of wind whooshes in. And Ruby, yes, Mouse? Don't forget about us, okay? How could I ever forget such lovely girls? And besides, you're all I've got. Act one, scene two. An elderly woman enters. Auntie Herkshire! Oh, hello, my lovelies. It's as cold as the devil out there. Are you all right? Do you, do you want some warm coffee? We have biscuits. Oh, I'm quite all right, dearie. Thank you. It's so chilly in here. I'll turn up the heat. Or, or I'll just get buckets. The furnace was working perfectly fine last time I came. No, I, uh, I'll just be a minute. No! No, Ruby, Ruby says we can't afford it. Burning cold costs money. Money we don't have. Oh, I'm sorry, dear. How about we do something fun? Fun? I dove fun! Yeah, I have something really fun. A story. Do you girls know this story? Yeah, yeah, back, back when I had school, we read it. Wow, booty full. <coughs> Auntie Herkshire, is, is Junebug all right? Hmm? Oh no, Bug, are you all right? Junebug, she's quite pale. Mouse, can you grab a little box behind the bowl? Junebug needs sugar. Is, is, this, is this it? Yes. I guess we are not feeding ourselves properly. Oh, sweetie, all will be all right, precious one. It will be all right, I'm sure. No, no, I, I just don't think it will be. I'm so sorry. I, I don't, I don't, I don't think Mom's coming home. And, and, and Ruby didn't want me to, want me to tell you. What? But Ruby got a letter from Mama saying that she wasn't coming, getting home for a few months. She promised. She promised, and she said that she'd be back. And it just. Nothing's going how we planned, and I feel like our lives are falling apart, and I'm beginning to think Mama's never coming home. Ruby was going to tell me, but she wasn't going to tell me. One night, one night I couldn't sleep, and I got up on the bed, hoping to find one of Ruby's, Ruby's old picture books you could look at, and, and I climbed onto the desk and fumbled through the papers, and I saw a letter from Mama. I unfolded it so fast, I thought I'd rip it. I can't read very good, but I, I could make out a, a few things, like not good, and high rent. But, but the thing that's surprised me most was, was the sentence, I might not be back for a few months. I don't understand what's happening. I, why, why don't we, why doesn't anyone have 
jobs anymore? Why isn't mama coming home? Why don't we recycle? Why do we recycle old grain bags and use them as clothes? Why? Why? Oh, honey, don't cry. Don't cry. Everything's going to be okay. A few months isn't very long, and your mama only said she might not be back till that time. Yeah, except last time she said that was two months ago. Do you know what the first time she said that she'd be back in a month or two was? It was two years ago. Two years. She's never coming home. Do you want to be alone for a little while? Okay. Ruby will be home soon. I'd better wake Jean Bud. Mouse walks to the bed and lays in it, humming the same melancholy tune from before, whispering to her doll. I'm so sorry for getting upset, Petunia. I'm just so fed up with everything. I don't understand any of it. How did we go from having enough money and jobs and a mama to having none of that? I think that this, that this whole thing was caused by evil people from the stories teachers told us at school. Someone somewhere got angry for some reason. And I also think that mom is never coming home. I don't trust her anymore. She left us for no good reason. She forgot about us. She doesn't care. Act one, scene three. Ruby bursts through the door. Junebug has been put down for her nap in a cardboard box that they use for a makeshift crib with a blanket inside. Oh, hello, darling. How has your day been? Well, it's been all right. It's not horrible. And I don't like the sound of that. What's the trouble? Can I speak with you privately? You know, where no curious ears can hear us? There's good news and bad news. <coughs> the bad news is that I lost my job today. You know, I, I have some bad news too. My niece has asked me to come stay with her family. They're struggling. I have to leave in a few weeks. They live in Kentucky. I'm so sorry that I have to leave you and your darling sister. Act two, scene one, one month later. Mouse sits cross-legged on the floor. She tugs up the edge of a wooden board and pulls out something shiny, also from the first scene. Oh, there you are. I've just taken Junebug to the bathroom. I do wish we had indoor plumbing. Mrs. Hershire's written a letter. She says that weather's actually all right in Kentucky and her mother is getting better. Do you want to read it? It's quite long. There's rather a lot to do today. I've got to go into town and get groceries. I'm hoping I can get a reasonable price on something or other. Have you had breakfast? Oh, no, I forgot to give you breakfast, didn't I? Well, I'll be getting something for lunch. Don't fret. And I do believe that they've opened the soup kitchen. Anything in particular that you'd like? No? All right. I'll come home for lunch, and then I'll be off to my shift at the bookshop. Oh, have you been enjoying the coloring book from the bookshop? That's great. Well, I'd best be off. I should be back around noon or so. Will you be all right till then? Good. I'm off then. She begins to pull on a coat when someone knocks at the door. Who on earth could that be? Mouse, get the door. There's a lady at the door. Lady! Lady! Hello, ma'am. How may I help you? I need a picture. R Ruby, wait, what? Are, are, are you okay? Who? She quickly realizes who the woman is. The woman stretches out her arms and leans down. Mouse runs at full speed into the woman's arms. Mama! End of play.
over to the closet and sees her brother in it. Hey! Why would you do that? <laughs> Were you scared, Ashley? Uh, uh, no. In fact, that was pretty lame. Whatever, you were totally scared. Next day, in the kitchen eating breakfast. <coughs> How did you guys sleep last night? Good, I guess. She plays with her food and looks down. Good. What's the matter, Ashley? Nothing. You're fine? Yeah, right. You're totally scared of the house. And Bob! R2! Stop this now. In Ashley's room. I hate this house. Why did Tad have to get a job here? I just, I just want to go home. The lights flicker. Stop, Henry. She goes into the hallway and sees Henry messing with the junction box. Ha uh ha! -huh. <laughs> Ashley, can you go to the attic and grab the box labeled books? Uh, fine. The attic. Cold, dark, animals, and spider webs. I don't think anyone has been up there in ages. In fact, I've never even gone up there. I've just heard terrible things about it. In the attic. off the dust, opens the box, and pulls out books. How are these books so old? Is that our house? No, it can't be. She opens the book and reads. That is our house. Hmm. Well, Mom's probably wondering where I am. I better get downstairs. She gets up and starts to walk, but the door is shut and locked. Henry! Stop it! Let me out! Henry! Fine, you wimp. Don't <laughs> call me that. I can call you whatever I want. Doing in the attic anyway. Mom wanted me to get her books. Hey. <laughs> in Ashley's room. Ashley is looking through the book on her bed. This is so weird. It says my house is haunted. I guess I'll have to do some research. Does research. Henry, come here. What do you want? I think this house is haunted. Haunted? You wish. I'm serious. I've been doing research, and turns out this house is 114 years old. And before I moved in, there was an old man who lived here and died. Ooh, spooky. <laughs> Whatever, believe what you want. Nighttime. Ashley wakes up from a loud thud coming from the attic. What was that? She falls back asleep, then hears a thud again. She gets out of bed and walks to Henry's room. Stop making those sounds. What thud sounds? I... Do you know what? No, I don't. Go back to bed. Ashley sighs and walks into the hallway. She looks at the attic stairs, hears the thud again, and jumps back in fright. Oh, this isn't Henry this time. She slowly walks up the stairs. Hello? A whisper cries from behind a box in the attic. Uh, who are you? And why are you doing this to me? I'm the owner of the house. Uh, no, you're not. Yes, I am. My, my father is. This is my house now. Leave. Uh, no. I said leave. Ashley runs downstairs into bed. The next morning, Ashley grabs her laptop and sits in bed. What is wrong with this house? She opens her laptop and researches. Finds shocking news. Whoa. She opens the door and runs up to the attic. Hello. Hello. I come in peace. Please come out. I can't. Why? I'm a spirit. Oh, that's okay. What are you doing up here? I just wanted to get you, get to know you better, I guess. Oh, okay. Well, what do you want to know? Mm, how you got here, I guess. Well, when I was 17 years old, I was, I was doing some stupid challenges with my friend. But one of the challenges didn't go so well, so... <laughs> I'm a spirit now. Oh. <laughs> well, how old are you now? How long have you been a spirit? I'm now 74 years old. So I've been dead for 57 years. Oh. Sorry. It's okay. I actually love being a spirit. Then why do you try to scare me so much? What do you mean? I've always heard weird noises at night, and I think you're trying to freak me out. No! I would never try to scare anyone. I'm a nice spirit. Oh, okay. <laughs> the next morning, Ashley is sitting on her bed, and a book falls off a bookshelf. Hello? Are you back? Sure am. <laughs> I haven't had any friends since I was alive. Yeah, I'm new, so I don't have friends either. Well, I 
guess we're friends. Forever? Forever. End of play. <laughs> to me. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta. Beta. Sorry, I, I was just, um... Just what? You know what your father said. I know. I'll try to concentrate. Good. Now let's take it from Alpha. Excuse me, Master. Your father is requesting to see you in the library. Requesting? Anything that ever came out of my father's mouth could never be categorized as a request. <laughs> and walking down to the library to see him was basically suicide. I really didn't have much of a choice. Jane, scene one. Jane, I know you don't want to, but it seems we have no choice. But I... Look, I don't want to scare you, but there are major problems that we can't afford. Your mother could die if we don't get her the treatments. I thought you said that you had extra money from working the station. Not nearly enough. Nothing's like it used to be. Ever since Mama got sick, Daddy's been so different. At first, the flyers were nothing, a simple suggestion that Mama said I should try because I seemed lonely. That was before the diagnosis. When we were still living the lives I missed so much. Even though everything was different, it was still my Mama I'd be doing it for. I knew what I had to do. I'll do it. That's my girl. Thank you. You have no idea what this means to me. I love you, Daddy. I love you more. Will seem to. He took me into the cupboard under the back stairwell. He unleashed everything. It was as if he was letting all of the anger he had ever felt into the whip. I'll never forget what that whip felt like. Hard, sharp, concentrated. It hurt almost as much as his look of disapproval. I, Ralph, I tried not to think of why he did it. It hurt too much. Jane, scene two. Eleanor and Jane are sitting on each of the two beds in the room and chatting while unpacking their clothes. So, where are you from? London, slums. You? Devonshire. How long have you been here? About two months. So, tell me, is the Lord's ego as big as this place? I hear otherwise about Lord Worthington from the butlers. What about that Master William? Hear anything about him? Not much. Um, he spends most of his time by himself. Well, Miss Brown told me to watch after you, so if you need anything, it won't be very hard to find you. Of course. I, oh, I almost forgot. Master William needs his breakfast taken to him in the morning. Mrs. Brown wants you up bright and early in time to be there for 8 o'clock on the dot. Don't be late. And your uniforms on the chair. <coughs> Will, scene three. Will is sitting in bed. Jane walks in with a tray of food. You're supposed to knock. <coughs> I would have expected that they told you that already. She okay. slams the tray on its bedside table. And I would have thought that a future Earl would have been taught basic manners. Excuse me. I'll be out of your way now. No, uh, you're right. I shouldn't have been so rude. What is your name, miss? Jane. Told the notice how pretty she was. I tried to fight the blush, but I worry it didn't work. <laughs> Jane, scene three. <coughs> this wasn't the home I grew up in. Things have gotten worse. Before, there were children playing with balls in the streets. I remember their expressions. They were happy, joyful. Now, those expressions have been replaced with terrified, sad visages worn on the faces of skinny looking, hungry children. This wasn't the home I grew up in. Something was wrong. Oh, Jane. Thank you for coming. I hope this isn't inconveniencing you. No, I got your letter. What's wrong? Where's Mama? Sit down, sweetheart. Now, I don't know how to say this, but there's been an outbreak. Cholera. There are so many people affected, one of which is your mother. Say something, darling. Jane? Where is she? Upstairs in bed. Jane walks to her mom's room. Mama? Jane. Jane comes by the bed and holds her mom's hand. What is it, Mama? I'll be 
gone soon. But don't think of me as gone. Think of me as going to a better place. A place where we'll never be hungry. A place where God is on our side. Take this. She gives Jane a ring. Mama, I couldn't. Yes, you can. I want you to. Take it. I love you, Jane. Remember that. She closes her eyes and doesn't open them. Mama! Mama, wake up! Please! Mama! I felt like a part of me had been removed. My mother was dead, and I couldn't bring her back. My mother was dead, and so was everything I ever had. She was everything I ever needed. She was my motivation, my trust, my courage, my life. My mother was dead now, and I had no way of going back to the life I grew up in. I have no way of going back to life as it was. Jane, scene four. Jane is holding on to her mother's hand. Let's go, sweetheart. Jane, it's time. I never even got to say goodbye. It all happened so quickly. Too quickly. I know, darling, but we're holding up the line. He was right. Dozens of people were waiting behind us. The worst part about it was that they all looked ready to accept it. They all looked distant, sad, but not devastated. And then I realized that I did really have to let go one last time. Will, scene four. Cholera. Cholera. How do I deal with that? I received notice from Miss Brown that there was a maid that just experienced her mother's death caused by cholera. I took the liberty of inviting her to explain the reason for this and ask her what she observed was the main need for the people affected by this. When is she coming? Jane enters. Ah, yes. Master William, uh, this is Jane. Yes, I think we've met before. I'm, I'm so sorry for your loss. Thank you, Master. Jane, we were wondering if you could tell us a bit about the circumstances in the slums. Yes, sir. They were horrific. It seemed that the greatest need was shelter. The doctors seemed to have traced the illness down to the water. The problem is that they don't have clean water. I see. Thank you, yes. I will look into the possibility of bringing in new water pumps to the towns. However, I have to get to a meeting right now. Thank you again, Miss Jane. Jane starts to walk out the door, but Will stops her. I do empathize with you. I'm sorry? I empathize with you. All due respect, Master. But I hardly think that you can understand what I'm going through, even remotely. My mother has just died due to the extreme poverty that you and your father haven't cared to address. Have you ever seen a child starve in the street? Ever seen anything happen in the real world outside of your palace? Well, I appreciate your consideration, but I think that you should examine the difference between empathy and sympathy. Brown, Jane is sick. I will step in and take the master his breakfast. What do you mean sick? What type? What are the symptoms? Vomiting, dehydration. And she went to the slums yesterday. Yes, ma'am, but what does it matter? She has the symptoms of cholera. Will Fiend five. The evening beatings were always the worst. They hurt the most. It was as if he was letting out all of the anger of that day onto me and into the wind. The gleam of his eye was terrifying as he did it. I was sore that night and I couldn't sleep. I never did, really. My soreness wasn't the only thing keeping me up. I couldn't stop thinking of her. I had that strange feeling the last time I saw her, too. I, as hard as I tried to push it away, I couldn't get rid of it. I decided to write her a letter explaining what I felt she needed to know. I, I didn't know what was ahead of me, but this seemed like the right thing to do. I, I would deliver the letter in the morning. He walks into Jane's room. Jane is lying on the bed with her eyes closed. William puts the letter on her bedside table. Then he looks at her one more time. He shakes her. Jane. Jane, wake up. He feels her cold hands. He cries softly. 
When I close my eyes, I imagine a different world, better than the one we live in. A world where it's okay for an earl to love a maid. One without hunger, without disease, without poverty. A, a life without whips. A life without anger. A life that killed the rich instead of the poor. A life of equality. But this dream could never be a reality. It was what made the world so sick, so vile, so cruel. When I close my eyes, I dream a dream of a world that will never come true. End of play. were chosen. We already did. <gasps> you scared me, Rowan. So we, we were chosen? Yes, uh, you and Michael. Great. Wait, what about you? I was the unlucky one. No, that can't be true, is it? It is. <coughs> What's wrong? You and I were chosen, but... For what? I was not. There must be a mistake, are you sure? Yes. Well, you said you would like to live in heaven with your family, and you got your unfortunate wish. I'm sorry, my friend, I truly am. Do not be sorry. It's the thing I wished for. I don't understand. Think of it this way. We all die, correct? Yeah, then mine just comes a little bit early. I understand. You don't feel it's a sad thing. You think it's unlucky that you aren't able to live your full life. Yeah, it's something like that. Wait, where's David? He went outside. Oh. It's the day of sorrow. Yeah, well, I hope you guys pass off my legacy. <laughs> For sure. Thank you, guys. You are the best friends. We no. are. <laughs> you two should get packing. Yeah. We sure will miss you. Wait. What if we could sneak through? No way. No, we'll get caught and we won't be allowed in. Absolutely not. We have to try. No way. Rowan, this is your decision. It's your life on the line. I'm not going to risk you guys. I'm sorry. My final answer is no. I... You guys really need to pack. Yeah. I'll go get some clothes. Oh, guys, the bus is here. Are you sure you don't want to come? Yes, I'm sure. Well, I guess this is goodbye. The next day. The asteroid will hit today. Please remain calm while impact is happening. Oh, God. <laughs> we must pray for Rowan and all the people left above ground. May God save his soul. The asteroid will be colliding with Earth in one hour. Please be ready for impact. Thank you. <laughs> it's time for us to survive this great beast. Can you finish praying? Yeah. I hope they told the people above ground they'll be remembered. I hope so. I'm going to miss Rowan a lot. Me too. He should be here with us. He was the wisest of all of us. I just received news that the asteroid is not able to destroy Earth. It will burn up in a, into a smaller, less effective rock, which will most likely not kill any animals or humans. You may all leave tomorrow. <laughs> hey! We will see our friend again! Yeah! I do feel a bit bad that he can't get what he wants. As long as the whole world won't die and we don't have to live here down in the dark. Yeah. I didn't think this bunker would work anyway. Same. 
50 feet of concrete would not block a 1,000 foot diameter asteroid. For sure. <laughs> hey guys, stop! <laughs> How did you get here? Oh, I snuck in. How? <laughs> well, last night while the guards were letting the president. What? The president is here? No, he went missing, so I took his place. <laughs> oh. That's smart. You're going yes. to get caught. No, I'm not. Like I said, he went missing. So he went missing. You took his place. Some who got in here, and now the asteroid's not going to destroy the planet. Yeah, I could risk getting caught. That makes sense. Yeah, you're going to get caught. Not if I can get out undetected. That's where you guys come in. You want us to sneak you out? That's kind of my plan. No way! I'm not going to risk myself so you could get out. Wait. <laughs> what if they don't know he's missing? Good point. No, they can't know he's missing because they would have caught me by now. So we won't have to sneak you out. No, probably not. Good. So all we have to do is look normal. Yeah, hope so. You won't be taken back to your houses by the bus you came here in. Well, should we get going? Yeah. Let's go home. End of play. <laughs> sleep. <laughs> okay, now what makes the night the night? Uh, the moon. So, I know, I'll call you lunar. Scene two. <laughs> so, this is your new home, lunar. Oh, and I almost forgot that there's really good news for you. Your friend Pool lives across the street from us, so we can come, we can visit all the time. Lunar jumps excitingly. <laughs> Ding dong, the doorbell rings. Tana comes over to shoot a video with Shane. Hi, Shane. So what was the surprise you were talking about? She's right here. She? Yeah, I have a special someone who I know you would like to meet, since you're my friend and all. Wait, what? I, that, that's great, but I thought she gets interrupted by Lunar jumping out from behind Shane and running to Tana. <laughs> OMG, sorry, I just got startled. <laughs> I knew I could trick you finally. You got me. <laughs> Who's this? That's Lunar, my new puppy. Oh, that is so great. Hi, Lunar. They play with Lunar for a while. Let's go shoot that video we were talking about. Bye, Lunar. We'll be in the other room. <laughs> okay, let's go. They go to shoot the video and leave Lunar alone with all of Shane and Tana's things. Oh, three. What am I supposed to do for the next three hours waiting for them to finish their video? Lunar sits around thinking of what to do while she's waiting. Oh, I know! I can give them a present. <laughs> oh, what? Mm. <gasps> hey, what about that thing up there? Mm, just gotta get it down. <gasps> Finally, I'll do this thing. One hour later, after ripping up the coat to shreds, I'm finally done! Now I'll invite ghouls over to show her what I made for them. Hi, Lunar, what's up? Not much. I was just bored and wanted to hang out with you. Okay, what do you want to do? Do you want to see who can catch their tail first? Of course I want! One, two, three, go! <laughs> <laughs> they play games and have fun. Oh, my. I'm so tired. Me, too. Okay, I am done with running, so now what do you want to do? They are both very tired and out of breath because they were playing and running so much for so long. Well, I have a big surprise that I wanted to show you. For me? No, sorry, Ghoul, not for you. Ha ha ha, sorry. <laughs> it's okay, Lunar. <laughs> so who is it for since you moved here and it isn't for me? Okay, here it is. Okay. Oh, gee, I love it! Thanks! <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. But isn't that Tana's coat? Lunar looks up at the coat rack, then to Ghoul, then to the coat. OMG, you are right! What do I do? I don't know. But if I were you, I would just be honest with them. Are you sure? Wouldn't they be mad about the coat? Well, if you're honest, 
get going. Bye! <laughs> Shane and Tom have finished their video. Scene four. OMG, I'm shook, Tom. Same, honestly. <laughs>
right. Come on, I'm sure it's cute. I don't know about this. Is it supposed to be this tight? You'll get used to it. Bailey, do we really have to go to this party? Yes, you already agreed to it. Fine. <coughs> what are you wearing? Mm, I was thinking ripped jeans and a crop top. Slut. <laughs> <laughs> what? Sorry, I didn't hear what you said. No, I just said it would be really cute. Oh, thanks. <laughs> when I first bought it, I didn't know if you would like it, but it's a relief. You okay, I'm going to go get dressed so we can get going to the party soon. Yeah, sure. I lied. I lied to Bailey. I never lied to her. And I just did. I don't recognize this Bailey. And I wish things could just go back to the way they were. Now we're going to a party dressed like we've never seen actual clothes, and I'll probably never see my best friend again. <laughs> How do I look? <coughs> you look really good. Thanks, gal. So you want to start heading over? Yes, of course. <laughs> Okay, let's get out of here. At the party. Wow, this music is really loud. Sorry, I can't hear you. This music is really loud. <laughs> I said that the music is really loud. <laughs> hey, uh... Bailey! Right, Bailey and... Squid. Oh, right. I can take your coats if you just want to head out back. Okay, thank you. So what's next? We just stand here? Come on, lighten up. You act like you've never had fun before. Be fine. Okay, I'm gonna go get us something to drink. No alcohol. I know! I don't get the point of this. We're here to have fun, but what does that even mean? I, you can't even understand what the singer is saying over these songs. Everyone's either drunk or almost there, and no one here is responsible. I can't leave, that'll upset B. I can't stay. Here. Don't worry, it's Sprite. Oh, thanks. Oh, look, there's Stacy. I'm gonna go say hi. You coming? <coughs> no, I, I think I'll stay here, but thanks. Okay. Hey, I'm Noah. Uh, yeah, I, I know who you are. You're the star quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> so, so who dared you? What? Well, I know you wouldn't want to come up and talk to me, and you're popular, so who dared you to come up and talk to me? Look, no one dared me to come up to you. I just saw that you weren't really interested in this whole party idea. You could tell. <laughs> My friend Bailey could tell. What's, what's so funny? You, you, you don't, do you know how disappointed she would be if she knew that? So she couldn't tell. You know, just tell me your name. <laughs> I saw that you weren't having a good time, and frankly, I'm not into this stuff either. Really? Yeah, I've never really been. So do you want to hang out tonight, maybe? Uh, uh, just don't worry, I don't mean like hook up or anything. I just mean, <laughs> I just mean do you want to like talk to this friend? <laughs> Don't do any funny business. You know what I mean. Whatever. <laughs> what was that all about? <laughs> nothing. Nothing. <laughs> so where were we? There's a big crash off stage. Both run off. Quinn runs back. Bailey's on the ground. What did you do? I'm sorry. I just gave her like six pills. I didn't know she never had one before. Wait, what, you gave her drugs? It's okay, she'll be fine. The, al the alcohol will wash it down. Alcohol? <laughs> she said she had Sprite. Come on, B, wake up. I'll call the police. Yeah, I don't think so. If you call the police, we will all get in trouble. So you aren't doing anything. No one is doing anything. <laughs> Noah picks up the phone. Put the phone down. No, I'm calling the police. Would you rather have a dead freshman lying in your living room or the police shut down a party that shouldn't have even happened in the first place? Noah, don't do this now. Hi, yes? You 
Yes, there's been an accident. Quinn holds Bailey's head in her lap. I knew this was a bad idea. I might never see my best friend again, and it's all my fault. I have to do something. Everyone's arguing. I would say that they're worried or empathetic to me and Bailey, but I think they're just scared for themselves. I have to do something. Okay. The police are on their way. Great. Thank you. I can't believe you did that. You know what, Mackenzie? Just get out. This girl could die, and I did the right thing. So get out while we try to keep her alive. <laughs> Thank you. It's time she does what's best for other people, and not just herself. The police walk in and carry Bailey off stage. Wow. That was an adventure. Yeah. Let's, um, let's go to the hospital to check on Bailey. <laughs> Sounds good. End of play. People who can retrieve. Where is the item and what is it? Put it on speaker. <laughs> it's a top secret item. <laughs> what is this item for? It's classified. We've tracked it down to the other side of town. You need to retrieve the item by midnight. It's five o'clock, Mert. Well, are you in? What do we get in return? Twenty thousand dollars. Yes! <laughs> Good luck. I thought this was just gonna be your regular Friday night, but no. <laughs> How are we supposed to do this? We have less than seven hours, and we haven't done a job like this in years. We're going to need help. Next scene, the other side of town. John has a backpack holding his phone that is on GPS. This place is sketchy. This area is known to have the most murders in the Midwest. <laughs> There's a loud noise of glass being smashed. Are we almost at the abandoned storage facility? Our GPS says we're two minutes away. Did you hear that? Yeah, it's probably just a gang. Toby comes on stage. He is part of a gang. You're sure right. <laughs> Behind John and Mert appear Tim and Bob who push them to the ground. What do you want? We heard you talking about some abandoned storage facility. We want it. If there's something valuable. We don't even know what we're looking for. <laughs> sure. Then why would you even venture to one of the most dangerous places in the Midwest and not even know what you're looking for? We just know the location, and someone said it would be over there. Let's ditch these guys. Wait! What are you doing? We need their help. We can't do this on our own. We don't know if we can trust them. We're running out of time! <laughs> Fine! Why are you guys whispering? <laughs> help us get the item. We'll give you part of the reward for retrieving it. How much? Ten thousand dollars! Where are we? My GPS says we're almost there. At the storage facility. We're here! Finally! Great, let's just get this over with. Wait, what are your names? He's Toby, he's Bob, and I'm Tim, but people call me Leaky. <laughs> so we're just supposed to break into here and get the item? Or? John takes a crowbar out of his backpack. Next scene in the facility. Wow, this place is dilapidated. It must have not been used in years. Yes, but then how did someone place an item in here? This must have been someone's old storage unit, and they placed the item here. Luckily, the CIA has put a tracking device on the item. Otherwise, we would be doomed. Wait, you work for the CIA? We do. You can't say anything or else the deal's off. Fine. We won't rat you out. The deal's still off. John looks to the back of the stage and sees the item. The other's turn. Bullseye. The item is in a case. Let's just get out of here before we get caught. Mert grabs the case, but then an alarm goes off. What is that? It's an alarm! They run off stage. <gasps> Next scene in the alley. We need to get back home! You think someone's gonna track us down? If you say that this item is worth more than $10,000 to retrieve, they're going to find us! You guys can come to our house for the night, so no one finds you. 
Then we'll give you the money and go our separate ways. Well, let's get out of here. Next scene, John and Mark's house. <sighs> We're here. You sure that by tomorrow we'll have our money? Yeah, then you guys can carry on with your lives. You know, this was pretty fun. <laughs> Glad you enjoyed it, because this is the last time we're doing a mission like this. A knock on the door. Who's that? Leafy steps closer, then opens the door, terrified. There's no one! Leafy sees an envelope and picks it up. Leafy opens the envelope and reads the letter out loud. Gentlemen, you seem to have stolen my item from my storage facility. You have one hour to put my item back in the storage facility, or else you will all die! What are we going to do? Well, we better give him what he wants. Next scene in the storage facility. Uh, we're here! John walks towards to where they first found the item and takes the item out of Merck's hand. Guess we can forget about all that money. John then places the item in the place they first found it. Come on, let's get out of here before something else happens. They walk off stage. The man who sent the letter comes onto the stage and grabs the item. Yes! Those fools don't even know how important this item is. Back at John and Mert's house. I can't believe this whole mission was pointless. Actually... He takes files out of John's backpack. I may have kept the item. Uh, the item we placed in the storage facility was fake. <gasps> Wait, so the item was some files? If the guy finds us, he'll kill us! Oh, we better give this to the CIA before he finds out. Now panting from running in CIA's headquarters, we find the man who was talking to him on the phone in the theater and show him the file. Oh, sir, you must know, the man who stole the item from thinks he has the item, but it's a fake. Sooner or later, he's going to figure out how are we going to find him and stop him. The man in the hoodie enters the office, and all of them notice him and stare. Who are you? What do you want? Oh, I just want my files back. You are not getting these files! The man in the hoodie steps closer to John. John then tackles him to the ground. Go! Get the files away from him! John gets punched and becomes unconscious. <laughs> <laughs> Mert sees handcuffs on the CIA, CIA man's desk and grabs it. Mert then handcuffs the man in the hoodie. No! You're going to jail for a long time, you thief! John wakes up. <sighs> You're saying you want to do these kind of missions like the one we just did? On a regular basis? Yeah. Well, are you in? Yes! <laughs> the phone rings. It's an unknown call. Perfect timing! <laughs> End of play. <laughs> seemed so long ago. It was all a normal day, but not for long. It was the second class period of the day, and I had music. I hurried to Mr. Johnson's room and made it just in time for the bell. I set my books down, and he started to take attendance. Ellen? Alexa? Beth? 
He didn't get to my name. He only got to the third name on the list. That's when I heard it. That's when everyone heard it. My body froze. A gunshot. I heard a gunshot. Everyone remain calm. You all know what to do. Someone ran to lock the door, and I rushed to the closet. I stood in the back corner, and everyone started to file in. Ow! You're on my foot, Myra! Beth, do you want to get us all killed? Stop talking! We all huddled together. I prayed and said what I was thankful for. I felt a drop on my cheek, and another, and then another. The door startled to rattle. I prayed harder, knowing that these could be my last few seconds alive. No one move. Please, Mr. Johnson. I was in the bathroom, and I didn't know where else to go. The voice that we heard sounded unfamiliar, but convincing. Mr. Johnson opened the door, and suddenly he fell to the ground and didn't move. I screamed, but no sound left my mouth. I closed my eyes, hoping that this was all a nightmare. And suddenly, it was over. The police came and ushered us all out of the closet. That day, we all lost something in that closet. I lost my innocence. Mr. Johnson lost his life. But no one helped Mr. Johnson up. And for all I know, he's still there in the music room on the floor trying to save his class. Scene two. Now we're back at school, two and a half weeks later, trying to act like everything's okay, trying to pretend like I didn't just see someone die two weeks ago. But that's what this town is about, acting like everything's okay, pretending that it's all back to normal, when nothing will ever be normal <coughs> again. Everything has changed. No one is the same. I will never be that same girl that I was three weeks ago, now that I know how the world works. Now I know that no one really cares what happened to us two and a half weeks ago. They're just glad it wasn't them in that closet. I don't think I've seen anyone in these hallways laugh or smile since we got back. It's like all the happiness and joy have been drained from all of us, and in a way, it has. Now we all have to go to an assembly to pretend we're all fine. But by now, we've all gotten pretty good at pretending. Scene three at the assembly. <coughs> Hello, students. The faculty and I have noticed that since our little break, grades have been starting to plummet. I am here to say that it is time to start focusing again. You must focus on your grades or what will become of your life. Of course. All anyone is concerned about is grades. Everything, everyone in this town is brainwashed and crazy. It seems like everyone just forgot. And if you have any questions or concerns about your grades, my door is always open. We are all brainwashed. This has happened to so many other people. And we're going to just ignore it? Not me. I need to do something. Maybe not something huge, but something to make a little bit of a difference. Scene four. Lights up in Myra's room. Sad. Alone. <coughs> Misunderstood. Invisible. That's what I am. I have no one here. Absolutely. No one. Mom is gone. She was gone a while ago. But it hurts the most now. Dad is always at work and pays no attention to me. Everyone assumes I'm okay. Not that anyone even cares. It's been two months and everyone is fine. How could anyone be fine ever again? I can't do this anymore. Dad enters. Sweetie, what's wrong? No one gets it! Sweetie, it's okay. I know how you feel. You can talk to me. No, 
You don't know what it's like or how it feels. I'm sorry, but have you seen someone die right in front of you? Oui. No, you don't. Now get out of my face. Myra, you have to be able to talk about these things to be okay again. But Dad, you don't understand. I can't talk about it. It makes me feel guilty for still being here on this earth. Mr. Johnson literally took a bullet for me. Not just me, but everyone in that closet. He gave up his life for 24 children who can't even thank him. He should be here with his family, enjoying his life. Now his four-year-old daughter won't even know how great a man he was. She'll live her life not knowing who he was and what he gave up. He should be here, not me. Myra, don't say that. Now think. What would Mr. Johnson want you to say? He gave up his life for you. He made that choice. Saying that's dishonoring his legacy. He gave up his life for you. So don't ever say that's your fault. Dad, that's not fair. No, it's not fair. I'm so sorry. Words can't explain how awful I feel. And you bet if I could switch places with you, I would do it in a heartbeat. But what do you think Mr. Johnson would say if he were still here? I know what he'd say. He'd say, I made the decision, not you. Don't beat yourself up about this, kid. Remember what I always told you. Be authentic, be real, be genuine, be yourself. Perfect. Now, get out there and express to everyone what you and so many of them are feeling, but just can't admit. Scene five, in the school auditorium, Meyer takes her place at the speaking podium. Hello, everyone. I know a lot of you don't know who I am or why I'm up here and probably don't even care what I'm about to say, but two months and three days ago, we all witnessed a horrific event. Now, who here knows who Mr. Johnson was? Well, if you don't, I'm here to tell you who he was to me, a hero, brave man, a courageous person, and a believer. He was a father, a teacher, and loved by many. He took a bullet for me. And how do we repay him? We completely ignore him and all that he did for this school. I'm here to finally honor him and his legacy. He was the head of music at Wilmore, so we will be renaming the new music room, Johnson Room of Harmony. I know that this will never fill the capacity of greatness that was Mr. Johnson, but he loved music, teamwork, and the students. He gave up being a father and being with his family because he was so dedicated to this school. I hope that years from now, students will know who this man was and what he did and accomplished. He saved my life and saved me from the aftermath. I will never, ever forget him. And his legacy will live on in my heart and in the hearts of many. End of play.
Ari and I wrote um, The Avengers of John and Ruth. Oh, Yeah. 